All right, everyone, so we are at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off and then let y'all hear the wonderful presentation that um, we have lined up for you today. Um, so welcome and thanks for joining the uh, session two of the program programmability webinar series with DevNet. Um, today's session is titled, How to Be a Network Engineer in a Programmable Age. So I see, first off, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Um, thank you for giving us an hour out of your time. Um, we know that everyone has busy schedules, so we're very excited to see everyone who is able to join us today. Um, again, welcome to the second session. If you are unable to join us for the first session, once Hank gets started today, I will share a link in the chat window where you can go and find the resources from that webinar, the recording and a PDF version of the slide deck. And as Hank is going along today, if you have any questions about what he's presenting on, please use the Q&A panel to ask questions. Um, if you, for some reason, cannot see the slide deck at the moment, or if you lose audio during the call today, please use the chat panel to communicate directly with me, and I will do my best to get you up and going again as quickly as possible. We are recording, so a link to today's session will be emailed out to all registrants. It will also be posted on the um, Programmability with Cisco DevNet blog on netacad.com. It'll be shared uh, on the Netacad social media channels. So plenty of places for you to go and find that recording if you're interested in re-watching today's session. Or again, um, if you would like to look at the PDF version of the slide deck, that will be posted on netacad.com as well. After today's session is over, um, I would really appreciate your feedback. And I am always interested in knowing what topics y'all are interested in for future webinars. It should just take about a minute, minute and a half. Um, very quick questions, drop down uh, menu, so very quick. But again, um, you actually have to exit out of the WebEx environment for that to pop up. So just a quick overview, like I mentioned, um, a few weeks ago we started off with session one of this series, and that was networking with programmability is easy. And again, I will share this link that you see at the bottom of the screen in the chat window once I turn uh, the floor over to Hank. Um, November 13th will be the next session, that'll be session three, and that session is titled Software Defined Networking and Controllers. Um, but you can take a few seconds and look at all the great topics that we have lined up for you over the next um, fiscal year. Uh, we truly hope that y'all are uh, able to join us in as many sessions as possible. And I know what most of you are thinking, certificate of participation. There will be an opportunity to sign up for a certificate of part participation for this series, um, but you cannot receive a, a certificate or sign up for that until the very end of this series. So the last session of, that will, of this series will be hosted in June. So at that point in the last live session, I will share a link that everyone can go to sign up to um, and request that certificate of participation. Again, you do have to uh, participate in all sessions of the series, um, and we're not giving out uh, participation uh, certificates for attending single sessions. So you can do that many ways. You can watch all the recordings. We hope that you can join us for the live sessions, or you can also do a combo of the two. We know that everyone has different work schedules, school schedules. So if you can't attend all the live sessions, you can still earn that certificate by watching the recordings as well. Um, we are doing a raffle also at the end of this series. So at the end of the series, again, we'll be raffling off 15 different Amazon gift cards in the amount of $25. So we'll be doing 10 Amazon gift cards um, to everyone who participated in all the live sessions. And then we will be raffling off five Amazon gift cards $25 again to everyone who participates in all the sessions. And again, um, those five will be, when I say all sessions, you can do that either by attending the live sessions or viewing, downloading the recording or a combination of those two. So again, I just wanted to get the certificate of participation out of the way at the beginning because I know that is a very popular question once we get going. So with that, um, I would love to introduce to you Hank Preston. He is our presenter today. Um, I know uh, many of you might have seen one of his presentations at this point. He's a wonderful presenter. You're in for a treat today. Um, Hank is joining us um, from DevNet. He's a developer evangelist with DevNet and focuses his time on demystifying network programmability. Um, NetDev offers the network automation while helping network engineers, both new and experienced, prepare for this new age of networking. 
Hank proudly holds a CCIE in routing and switching and believes that core networking knowledge and skills are just as important as ever. Um, so with that, Hank, um, I am so happy to have you on the call today and I will pass you the ball and the floor will be all yours. Great, thank you so much. All right, I have the ball. Let me get the sharing going. Excellent. All right. I believe I'm sharing. Are you getting my slides? I am. I see your first slide. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, let's dive right in. So as mentioned, my name is Hank Preston. I'm a developer um, advocate and a member of our DevNet team. And DevNet focuses on network programmability and all things programmable at Cisco. And so it's a free resource for folks looking at getting started in the world of Python and APIs or taking advantage of some of the new um, the new features that Cisco is offering. In today's discussion, I want to take a look at what it means to be a network engineer kind of in this new land of SDN and programmability and automation and net DevOps. Because a lot of us have been on this journey for a while and, and we get so focused in on some maybe just automating network configuration or dealing with some of the buzzwords that are there. And so we're going to let's let's spend a bit of time kind of looking at what it really means and why it's different in this world. We're going to be covering a handful of topics today. So we're going to kind of do this. Uh, you're going to join me on this journey through time. So we're going to start out with looking back at kind of the network engineer of old, what it meant to be a network engineer, uh, what the network looked like um, as we've probably been going for the last several years, and then kind of look through this span of time of something I like to call the four ages of networking and kind of how the evolution has brought us from where we came with the, the original time of, of kind of IP and TCP IP and, and basic networking functionality up to today where we've got cloud and DevOps and all of these other pieces and how did we get there? Well, then to spend a little bit of time about talking about the impact that cloud specifically has had on infrastructure and IT, but also networking in there and how we need to react and adjust to it. And then one of my most exciting topics these days is to talk about net DevOps, which is this combination of DevOps principles and how we can apply them into network engineering and network automation as it goes through. And then finally, at the end, we'll kind of take a glimpse after going through all of the material, kind of what does it mean to be a network engineer? Uh, what does the skill profile look like? And how do we start to add some of these new skills necessary into our toolkit that's there? So without further ado, we're going to jump right into ye old network engineer, uh, kind of this old day of CLI-driven piece where we kind of hands on keyboard with commands like write mem and copy run start and that very kind of traditional way of thinking about what a network engineer was and what a network engineer's job was about and kind of how they dealt with it. And through today's uh, presentation, we're going to kind of journey along with a good friend of mine. That's Carl, the network engineer. And Carl has been doing networking for years and years and years. He's, he's gone through the ranks. He's, he, when he first got started, it was more than just TCP IP, and he had to learn a bit of IP, uh, IPX and Apple Talk and these other protocols. So he's been around the block for a bit. And Carl's a, a network engineer who's looked up to by the, his fellow network engineers in his organization because he's built himself a set of skills that have served him very well over the decades that he's been doing this or the years that he's been doing this. And like many network engineers, right, he is very well versed in spanning tree and layer two resiliency and understands kind of the importance of how to well craft um, a, a, a loopless network as it goes through. But Carl's not just kind of layer two only. No, he understands his routing protocols. He's actually one of his favorite pastimes is jumping back and forth in the great debates between EIGRP or OSPF and, and helping junior engineers understand kind of where RIP fits and why we don't actually see the RIP routing protocol in many production networks, but it's a great learning tool. As applications came onto the network, he figured out how to do shaping and make sure that those critical business apps with quality of service receive the, the priority and kind of the, shape, the, the treatment required. Building VPNs to connect designs. Um, spanning tree. I mean, the, Carl has this story that he goes through and, and he, he'll sit down every now and then at the, in the lunchroom and, and explain the, the great spanning tree outage of 2002 when he was sitting in the data center and we, they'd been under this big issue in the network for several hours at this point and he was looking at this CAT 6500 mounted right in front of him and the, the lights are blinking all over the place and 
he just had this this sense of inspiration. It was like Radia Perlman herself was over his shoulder and guiding his hand as he reached out and unplugged one of the fiber cables and and brought that bridging loop to a standstill. I mean, I still get like chills thinking about that experience and and that story is just like gone down in in history is like a, a very explicit area where the Carl was able to come through and bring the company back from the brink of a major outage as it went in. Voice came to the network and so voice over IP and then shortly thereafter storage protocols and MPLS label switching and did I mention how well Carl understands spanning tree and how important that has been to his, his kind of lessons and skills becoming a network engineer? And along with kind of those fundamental networking pieces that are there, over time, Carl's had to pick up a few things that we would group into kind of programming skills as it goes through. And so Tickle or TCL, right, that scripting language. And, and like Carl, I learned a little bit of Tickle when I was studying for my certifications because it's part of kind of learning how to test your topologies quickly. If you're sitting for the CCIE, everybody learns some basic Tickle scripts to go through. And then after getting sick and tired of being woken up at 3 a.m. because some junior engineer mistakenly shut off the running interface on a core switch or router, he learned some embedded event management, EEM, so that he could monitor for events and then automatically recover from some of those common behaviors that went through. And maybe some expect scripts have gone through. And so this is kind of the skill set that Carl has had and he, he honed over the years. Uh, building up, building uh, uh, capabilities, earning certifications, working through. And for many years, this kind of suited him very well. And this type of a skill set was really developed when the network looked like this, right? And many of us probably remember this, and some of us may still think, that th think of a picture like this when you think of the network, right? We've got routers, and we've got switches, and then we've got servers and desktops that connect to the switches. Um, I remember the good old days when the network was like this. We could walk into a data center or a telecom closet. We could reach out and we could touch the network, right? It was these physical boxes. Uh, back in that day, they were all like this teal green and had Cisco silk screened on the front of them, right? That was the network. It was really, really clear. Um, and for many years, that's kind of what the network was. It was routers and switches and things connected to them. But slowly, uh, let's say five, six, maybe 10 years ago, the network started to change a little bit and new pieces came into it. The first piece that I remember um, noticing for this was the V switch, the virtual switch. Uh, at the time when I first got exposed to V switches, I was, I was working inside of a hospital and, and we had implemented this new piece of software called VMware and it was ESX hypervisors. And there was a V switch that lived inside and, and I would scratch my head and and Carl and I would, would kind of come back together and be like, what is this V switch? I mean, switching isn't software, right? A switch is a piece of hardware and running inside of some application and we're gonna embed VMs inside of the server. And, and this is something that's installed by the server team. And, and myself, like many network engineers kind of said, you know what? Let's just let the server guys deal with these V switches, right? It's VMware, it's a server thing. Uh, they're not even doing any kind of routing that goes through. You know what? We'll just let the server guys deal with it. And, and we know nobody's ever going to put anything of importance on a virtual machine. I mean, it's going to be physical servers. And so at this point, right, most of the most network engineers said, you know what? We'll just let the, the server guys handle that V switch thing. We'll stick with the real network, the physical network. And then not even that long after the V switch kind of came into the environment, this next guy came in blade switches. And this happened when servers started to go from kind of independent rack mount servers to blade servers that slid into a chassis. And then this chassis had these things in the back that would connect into them. And there were there were places for network cables and storage cables and management cables that went in. And we learned that there was there were IO modules because often we didn't even call them switches. Maybe they were bridges, which I always thought was a little weird when someone would argue that it wasn't a switch, it was a bridge, because that's kind of mean the same thing that went in. And when the blade switches came into network environments, Carl and his buddies looked at it and be like, were like, well, it's a switch, like there's cables that go in, we get it, but, but it came from a server PO, the server guys bought it, maybe it's from IBM or 
or HP, you know what, let's just let the server guys deal with that piece of equipment as well, right? The, the network, the real network, that's this, these routers and switches that we can touch as they go through. And so at this point, the network now was kind of getting partitioned where there were different teams handling different parts of the network. And the network continued to evolve, right? Today, behind those virtual machines that are running behind virtual switches, we now have Linux bridges or LBRs that provide network connectivity to a series of containers or the little C's that are out there. And so now we walk into organizations and data centers and look at the network and, and the real workload that's driving applications, that's making businesses function, right? These are running inside of microservice containers connected to Linux bridges, running on virtual machines connected to a vSwitch finally hitting a physical server that more than likely may be behind a blade switch. And then finally, we get to this network that Carl and the typical network engineer kind of pictures in their mind when they think about a network. And so we, it was around this time is when Carl realized that, you know what, maybe the network isn't just this physical stuff that I'm used to. I don't want to be have the so far from the actual workloads. And so Carl started to think, maybe we got to dive deeper in and, and learn a bit more about how some of these other pieces go in. But it didn't even stop here, right? The impact of the cloud and how that factors into the network engineer's job and what the network is, is so important to recognize as well. Inside of the cloud, we have virtual machines that may be running Linux bridges and containers but we don't have any visibility at the actual infrastructure that those connect into, right? That's, those are cloud resources. Often we don't have any access to that, let alone the types of things where we just have containers running directly on the cloud or database as a service or directory as a service, serverless applications, right? What does the network look? How do we manage a network where we actually have no access to the wires where the packets are flowing? And then don't let, don't be distracted by the cloud exchange. I've seen so many network engineers get so hooked in and excited about cloud discussions and they simply want to talk about how do I connect my data center to a public cloud resource and they get to feel like they're back in their comfort zone at routing and encapsulation technologies and point to point links. That's a big part of the cloud piece that's there, but there's so much more to it. It's right. We got to remember it's the, the workloads that connect into the network. That's where we need to make sure that we're focusing in as well. And then balance the slide out. The network and network engineering and network operations today is more than just kind of TCP IP and, and kind of routing and packets across the network. There's all the services that layer on top to make sure our networks are secure and resilient. Load balancers and firewalls and IPSs and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And the oh my is right. When, when I think about what is the network and what's, what's the purview of network engineers and network operators in an organization, this isn't even complete. There's just kind of the limit to how much Hank is willing to squeeze into one single slide. But the network is huge, right? There's all of these components. And I think it's important for network engineers to keep this in mind, this type of a view in mind when they think about the network, because this is what we're working through. And I don't want to be a network engineer that's just responsible for this little bit at the top, right? I want to be responsible for all of the components and be able to understand how they all fit in. All right, so that might be feel a little bit overwhelming at this point. So let's go back to something that I'm sure everybody on the audience, everybody on the call will feel some comfort with, right? The OSI model of networking. I imagine many of you have studied for or already taken a certification exam and memorized all sorts of mnemonics to help you with the physical data link network transport session presentation and application layers of networking now if we're honest with ourselves there's seven layers we memorize them we can answer the the certification tests appropriately but i think we're all can agree that there's really only three layers to the osi model of networking in the middle there right is the oh yeah we got this layer it's the top half of layer two in the data link that gives us MAC addresses. We're well versed in IP addressing and subnetting and routing. Like we get that really well. And then many of us have a pretty good understanding of TCP and UDP and how ports work and what common ports are for. Like we've got that. So that's our that's our sweet spot. That's the sweet spot layer. The oh yeah, we got this layer. Below that is this black magic layer of the physical layer and then the vast majority of the data link layer that goes through before we get to the MAC addresses. 
this is an area of the network where many network engineers today look at a, a problem at the physical layer and, and their troubleshooting mechanism is like unplug and plug the cable back in. If it's fiber, maybe we switch the order of the orientation of the fiber pairs, hoping the link late comes on. Uh, and then after that, we're kind of lost. And I think a lot of that physical layer stuff went away when we started to get auto MDX, where we didn't have to pay attention to crossover cables anymore. And things just kind of worked when we plugged them in. It, it let us kind of forget some of the fundamentals of the physical layer. And then the data link layer's got more than just MAC addresses in it, but outside of passing a certification exam, many of us don't pay that much attention that's in there. And then let's not forget about the top of the stack. We've got the please don't ask me about this layer, right? Session presentation application. By word, it's got application in the name. Clearly, that's not something that a network engineer has to pay attention to. Um, let's just, oftentimes, we kind of focus in and we come back to just that middle area of the OSI model. But what's important, kind of as these changes have gone through, we, we talked about what makes up a network today as we looked at the last couple of slides. In the physical layer, we have to recognize and be more comfortable with that as new protocols for multi-gig, right? We can now get out of a CAT6 cable, 2.5 gig, 5 gig, maybe 10 gig. In the data center, we're getting fiber connections that are going to give you 45 and 25 and 50 and 100 gig that goes through. We have to understand how do we spec cables appropriately, making sure the right ones that are there. And then at the top, application presentation and session layers are becoming more important than ever as organizations are moving to microservice architectures where APIs are driving how things interact. We truly need to understand how the HTTP protocol processes and understand what's meant by a header inside of an HTTP and how do we, we uh, read through things like posts and gits and patches. Like We have to get some fundamentals across the entire OSI model. We can't just kind of hone in on just that piece in the middle. And so with some of that in mind and the background and kind of where we're coming from, let's walk through the ages of networking. And as the slide indicates here, we're gonna start out with the stone age of networking. And, and I don't say stone age in a negative sense, right? I liked the stone age of networking. And sometimes it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. In the stone age of networking, organizations would put in networks and they were really just maybe to connect their, their printers and their PCs and a couple of things to go through so they could have this little local area network that was there. And network engineers concerned themselves with spanning tree <clears throat> and VLANs. And the spanning tree conversation was more about knowing that we needed to have it and less about making sure that it was super fast. Because if it took 45 seconds to reconverge, nobody really noticed or cared. And our VLAN discussions were usually just about, do we put our PCs and our printers on the same VLAN? Or do we split them up? And, and many of us realized as fun as it might be to split them up, it was just simpler to stick everything on one VLAN. It didn't matter that much. The Stone Age in enterprises in, with networking stuck around for a while, but we did eventually make it to the Bronze Age of networking. I like to think of the Bronze Age as kind of the e-commerce, the dot-com era, where every enterprise was building large, wide area networks, connecting their different offices together getting it, uh, on the internet so that they had web presence that went through. And so routing protocols, WAN design became critical as they went in. And the Bronze Age, believe it or not, this is where IP Mageddon happened, the IPv4 address exhaustion, that big kind of focus and fear so many organizations had, and they spent all the resources kind of dual stacking IPv6. And I'm thankful we've made it through there. And, and everybody's network, everybody's out there has got dual stacked end to end. I joke a little bit, but, but that was one of the funny things about IP Mageddon. It was like the Y2K for anybody that may have been around for that. It was a lot of worry up front, but it really didn't seem to turn into a whole lot of peace. And, and many organizations kind of came and saw IP Mageddon go by and have found ways to get around it and just kind of extend out. So many of us are still kind of living in an IPv4 world. The Bronze Age came through and then brings us to the renaissance of networking. And this is the age of SDN, software defined networking, when it came in about a decade ago and brought in like the, the art and the industry renaissance, all sorts of new ideas for networking. This is when concepts like open flow and decoupling uh, control plane and management plane from the actual forwarding plane, and centralizing people things together through controllers, building overlay networks, multi-protocol BGP. This one still scares me a little bit, right? I have a good understanding of BGP, but that's for IP. Like now we're throwing more than one protocol at it. Why does it have to get so complicated? 
And then VXLAN, right? We've come back in the Renaissance with a new network segmentation strategy. And if there's something I've learned from being at Cisco and working in the networking space for this long, it's that if you need to reinvent something, add some new panache to it, you simply put an X in the name. And so I think that's where we went from VLAN to VXLAN, is X always makes things better as they go through. Well, the Renaissance had all these ideas. Some of them uh, kind of grew. Some of them kind of filtered out and became less important. And that brings us to today, into the programmable age. And in the programmable age of networking, what we got is this is kind of coming out of the Renaissance and realizing what ideas kind of fit in. How do we really need to evolve? Where do we need to change? And so now in the programmable age, it's about cloud. It's where Python is becoming a fundamental technology that network engineers need to know so they can consume new APIs like REST or these new protocols like NetConf and Yang. We're building fabrics. And now we're trying to figure out how do we work with DevOps concepts as they go through. Like, this is the growth that we've had. And what surprises me or what always shocks me so much here is how quickly these last couple of stages went through. How quickly did we, we move from the Bronze Age to the Renaissance, the Programmable Age? What caused that acceleration of time as it went in? And I, I like to think that it really does come back to this concept of the digital enterprise or the digitization of the enterprise. Now, digital enterprises have turned into a buzzword and so many people talk about it. And, and frankly, I've been in meetings that felt like this one on the slide where some enter, uh, executive was sitting down in front of the team saying, I need an agile, bimodal, hybrid cloud so we can develop our containerized, trustless, serverless microservice applications to take us digital. We need to avoid the disruption of the unicorns and don't forget about DevOps. We need two of those. Right? There's this, this concept that this digital change is, is all of these things and we can just throw a bunch of technology at it. And now, being the engineer that I am, I come out of meetings like that and I'm like, okay, what's real? What do I actually have to go through? What's, what's causing the push and the pressure on our executives for these pieces? And I break it down into kind of three buckets that go through that, are, that I can grasp, that I can understand. Many years ago, right, as, as the mobile, um, mobile devices and tablets, smart devices went really wide, and, and most people, particularly ones that are in enterprises, kind of in this space, we're all walking around with these mobile computers. And we've got this app economy idea where basically anything I want to do, there's an app for it. And, and those apps come out quickly. They update quickly. If there's new ideas and features, they get added really, really rapidly. And so our user expectations are that they want that agility. They want all these new things coming at them and they want it coming quick. Because if I can handle that in my personal life, right, with some basic entertainment, if the, the movie companies can update my app and give me information that quick, why can't I get that from the banks and the healthcare systems and the, the insurance companies and the manufacturers that I work with, right? We've got this new expectation that the app economy has driven to us. And then there's the Internet of Things, or as I like to call it, today, if it isn't connected, don't even bother, right? Today, not five years ago, you would see smart devices were just the premium line of refrigerators and, and toasters and washing machines. Today, it seems like nearly every appliance and everything that we might bring into our house is an IoT device that's connected as it goes through. And this has put huge pressure on networking teams to figure out how do we connect these together? How do we secure the data? How do we make sure that the devices that are connected are secure? And, and if we take the assumption that they're probably not, how do we protect the rest of the network, the rest of the environment from video cameras that go haywire? And then I think the real pressure that's hitting a lot of the large enterprises today is the pressure from the tech unicorns. The barrier of entry has been lowered so far that if you have a great idea, a credit card, and a garage, you can build a startup that takes on just about anybody be it a car company or a, a hospitality industry or a thermostat company, right? It doesn't matter what you do. Everything is being rethought and it's being rethought rapidly and new ideas going through. And so our business leaders, our executives are tackling these challenges and figuring out how am I going to solve this? How in IT are we going to solve these challenges? And I've mentioned it a few times and probably a few of you recognize it, right? The answer that came up was cloud. Cloud was going to come into every organization and fix all of these issues. We were going to build a cloud that protected us from those digital unicorns and go through all those. And in fact, we were going to build a cloud that was our own unicorn. 
And I've helped many organizations kind of jump into these areas where they, they sit down and they've got this vision of this bright, beautiful unicorn of a cloud. In their data center, they were basically going to replicate whatever was possible in the public cloud. They were going to build their own Amazon or their own Google or Azure. But frankly, what many of these organizations found at the end is after they tackled these projects, they didn't end up with a unicorn cloud. They ended up with a donkey corn cloud. And the reason because that, that so many unicorns actually came out as donkey corns is, is the approach in IT and infrastructure that we've taken to the cloud challenge. We kind of went after it saying, okay, well, we've got an IT stack. We've got data centers. We've got resources. We'll just throw a little bit of automation at it. We'll throw a catalog, and then we'll just kind of give it to the application developers, give it to the lines of business, and it'll fix things. And that has failed miserably time and time again. There's so many stories of cloud projects that miss the mark. And having seen so many of these and, and frankly, been a part of some of them myself, I, I think I understand what a big part of the problem is. And I call it the cloud gap. When we think about the infrastructure stack that organizations need today, right? we've got at the bottom, at the foundation, building the base of everything that's there, are architects and operators, infrastructure teams that are providing infrastructures and operating systems that we can install our applications and systems on. And then up at the top are our users, our developers, our application teams, and they're focused on their development environment. And that development environment has advanced a lot in the last 10 years and even more for some organizations with the advent of DevOps and microservices and new application architectures. So users and developers, they just want to focus on their development environment and they've got a set of tools that they work through. And it's this, this space between the developers side and the inf what the infrastructure guys provide, that's the cloud gap. And everybody re has recognized that it's there. And so we've tackled this kind of from both sides. At the base, right, we've gone through cloud management and automation systems and started to bring new elements into our infrastructure stack. And at the top, the users and the developers started to build new tools or adopt new tools around kind of automating the code delivery pipeline so they could take their application services and more efficiently kind of get it pushed out and get closer, right? automate those areas. And frankly, this picture here for me is the biggest example of what a donkey corn might look like because we still have this giant gap. We have something that's been delivered that architects and operators consider as cloud, but it's still not close enough to what the users and the developers need because there's these other layers that are required for proper application delivery today in the models that are being done. We've moved out of the land of x86 virtualization and into containers. And so we need container platforms. And then we need scheduling systems to figure out where do these containers go across the infrastructure stack. And we can't minimize the impact that open source applications and components have had inside of organizations today. Application and middleware tiers are now being made up less and less often of these commercial products that have gone through and more and more often by open source projects that can go in and can be consumed. And so what we end up with is we end up with, with these requirements. Somebody has to provide these types of components as they go in. Somebody has to provide the containers and the application middleware. Who's going to do it? Is the, are, are the architects and operators going to span up or the developers going to span down? Now, frankly, what's happened for many organizations is users and developers have taken that over and, and moved off to the public cloud to figure out how to go because it's been simpler to consume those pieces. What I'm finding more and more often now is what organizations are really being successful with is by actually bringing in a new tier of engineer, the DevOps engineer. And the DevOps engineering teams kind of span the cloud gap. They take over management and automation from infrastructure teams. They start to deliver delivery pipelines to development teams, and then kind of package this up in a consumption area. And so the question often comes, like, where do DevOps engineers come from? Are they birthed from the tiers of uh, unicorns that have fallen on the, the burned out ground of all of those donkey corn projects? Are they like, are they mythic in nature? Like where do the DevOps engineers come from? And frankly, they're not mythic. DevOps engineers come from the top and the bottom. I've met DevOps engineers that started life as, as network engineers or systems administrators and have found a kind of a, a passion for open source projects and containers and automation. And so they, they move up to become DevOps engineers. 
And there's plenty of developers that started out as web developers that realized that they didn't like that that much, but, but managing delivery pipelines or Kubernetes, they had some passion for those. And so DevOps engineering teams are often made up of kind of elements of both, which makes them really well suited to span kind of the cloud gap that's there. If we bring in some cloud terms, right, infrastructure as a service, IaaS, those are those bottom three layers, that, that area where the donkey corn problem often happens. If that's all you deliver, that's just frankly not enough today. Platform as a service is kind of everything on top of infrastructure as a service. And there are many variations and spectrums for platform as a service from full commercial offers to fully curated build your own platform as a service and anywhere in between. And organizations can either buy a commercial IaaS or PaaS or build their own and, and mix and match them as they go through. This is how things are, are happening. And the stakeholders that are involved in the network from this view is we have to recognize that the network builders are not the only ones interested in the network today. We also have all of the network consumers, right? We've got users of the network. And it's not that the network was never used before, but for many years, we, we had a pretty distinct line. And, as network builders, as long as we provided connectivity, um, that was enough and we didn't have to concern ourselves with specifics from the consumers, right? They could just take what was there. But today's network consumers, right, they're, they're asking for more things. They want services from the network. The connectivity was kind of the, is the original network service, but now there's segmentation and analytics and, and other types of services that the network can provide to these organizations. And they want the network just to work like a utility. They want the network to function the way that they get the network out of public cloud, like Amazon Web Services, AWS. Like that's what they're looking for in here. And for me, this is where this, the concept of, of Net DevOps starts to come through. And with Net DevOps, what we're, we're finding is that we're taking some of the strategy, the culture, the best practices from DevOps that has kind of invaded the, the software development space and figure out how to apply them into the networking area. And frankly, we can't just take everything about DevOps and apply it to networking because building and managing a network is vastly different than writing a software application. That doesn't mean that there's nothing we can learn. It just means we have to adjust and figure out how these things fit in. And DevOps is first and foremost a culture. So let's think a little bit about the culture of networking, right? Today, many organizations I talk to have what I like to call a culture of fear around their network. You go into an organization and network changes rarely happen. And because they're rare, they end up being huge and complicated. And our network engineering teams, they just don't have the practice because they don't do it that often. And so every network change is seen as this huge risk. It's a risk that is everybody watching it. When the day of the network change comes through, you'll end up with the network operations and engineering team doing the work, but also the managers of the network team, the telecom directors, the application teams are there listening in on the bridge, application owners, and depending on the size of the change, maybe all the way up to directors and executives in the organization, all watching this network change that goes through. And by and large, a problem is going to happen during these changes. I mean, how couldn't it when, when we try to cram so many things into one change and we we don't have the ability to test and practice, and so something goes wrong. It may not be a burn the network down and start over from scratch type of a problem. It could be as simple as, as a ping taking a little bit longer to return after some sort of a change in the network. But everybody's so on edge that that little problem results in that change being seen as a complete failure, and so changes rarely happen. It's this reinforcing loop that we have to break out of. And for me, that's the first piece. That's kind of where we're headed is how do we break out of the culture of fear into the culture of change? Where inside of the network, change is seen as a regular activity. And so we can make them small. We can become really well practiced in how these changes will go through. We can figure out how to test and verify the changes as they go in. And then the changes can be uneventful and, and we've seen as a success and we reinforce the ability to maintain changes as a regular activity. Like this is the direction we have to go. And a big part of this is going to be implementing concepts of like network as code and delivery pipelines, where we're going to move where network configurations start to be stored in source control systems, things like Git and GitHub. And we begin to treat our network like it's code, right? Today, many organizations, network configurations, the only place they're stored is on the network device itself. Maybe you have a template stored someplace for a baseline, 
but you would never consider that's a, that is the network. The only way to know what the network is configured at is to go look at the network, right? That has led us down this path, and we have to kind of move to this idea of the network is code, it's stored in source control. We start to adopt pr principles from software development so that we, we use code branches with tools like Git that they go through. And then we implement kind of CICD or continuous development. Software development is done today where software developers make a change and then they commit that into their source control systems and then automation tools kind of act on that. They deploy the software changes, they test to make sure that they're valid, and then if everything is good, they position them potentially to go out to production. We want to figure out how do we do that same thing in the network and so that we don't have those 3 a.m. change windows where we're copying and pasting from Notepad++ into PuTTY, hoping that we don't have a buffer overrun, right? We want to use these tools. We want to figure out how do we bring all of the skill sets, all of the capabilities from network automation and Python and APIs and combine them with workflows that wrap around these DevOps concepts. And to do this effectively, our, our tool bag, our tool chest begins to change. It starts out with the network device, because we are still network engineers, but we're starting to bring in virtualization platforms. So whether their they're production systems are used for test, many of our platforms today, organizations just don't want hundreds of, of 1U firewalls or load balancers or routers. Right? So many things are being virtualized today. And while the interface to the network, right, the CLI, SNMP, these traditional interfaces we have aren't going away anytime fast, but we also need to begin to move towards newer data models and interfaces that are more accustomed to a programmatic fashion, which is why I talk and train so much on things like the new standards of NetConf and RESTConf, and we've done sessions on that with Netacad in the past. The way we'll push configurations out are not going to be Notepad++ to PuTTY, we're going to start to be build strategies around configuration management. And these may, me, may be made up of open source tools like Ansible or commercial products like Cisco NSO, or maybe even do-it-yourself homespun Python frameworks using things like Napalm and these other areas. But this is how the network is going to be configured in the future because that's what's going to give us the consistency and the scale necessary to go through. I just talked about network configuration pipelines through CICD, and, and so skills around distributed source control, so Git skills and GitHub or GitLab, and then build servers for, to be able to actually automate and the actions necessary to take these network configurations and push them into the systems. We'll, we'll have new build server skills that go through. Along the way, we're going to change the way we test our network. Today, we test our network primarily by pinging it. Can I ping from one side of the network to the other? Right? That's how we test. And frankly, that's a terrible way to test the network. The fact you can ping from one side to the other is a starting point, but, but is your routing protocol actually behaving as expected? Do you have the neighbors that you want? Is the path traffic going through your network? Is it appropriate for what you expect? And so there's new tools that are kind of fitting into the test tooling space. And then one of the, the major, the biggest changes we're going to see in the networking space is around environments. Most organizations I talk to simply have a production network. Maybe there's a lab with some old outdated gear that you have from the last refresh, or maybe somebody trolled eBay and bought some old stuff. But very few organizations have what I would consider an appropriate test environment, some place where you could test out production changes before they went in in a way that you could have a high degree of confidence of success, let alone a development environment, which I think is just as critical. The development environment is this idea that every network engineer, every network developer, every net DevOps engineer needs a place where they can experiment with ideas, test stuff out, see how things are working as they go through. That's the only way that we can have the agility and bring down the stress levels of the type of changes and the types of new things that are going to go through. And so while we're here, if I just overlay this a bit with some of the products from Cisco, kind of where does Cisco fit into these spaces? And at the device, at the, the virtualization spot, Cisco has been working long and hard to make sure that we've got virtual platforms for as many of our infrastructure as possible. So routers, wireless controllers, firewalls, application appliances, nearly all of that can be virtualized today. And then we have platforms like Viral and CML that you can leverage to kind of deploy those. 
And then for many years now, we've been adding APIs and new data models across our portfolio, be they something like DNA Center Platform in the controller space or ACI for the data center, our cloud functionality with Meraki, and all the way down to the individual device layers with iOS XE, XR, NXOS, compute, security. Every platform from Cisco today has additional interfaces that you can leverage on top of the traditional CLI, SNMP, and GUIs that are there. In the configuration management space, one of my most exciting kind of cool tools to play with today is Network Service Orchestrator, which gives us a CLI and API across our entire network. It's a great way to get involved and kind of move up the stack to managing the entire system and, or service and configuration management across your infrastructure. And NSO is now available completely for free from DevNet for folks to learn in development and non-production areas. We've also got lots of open source projects to help with this network testing and telemetry area so that we can fit in. And then at the base, we've got the tools that'll allow these environments to be built appropriately. So I've been going for a while. I've been going for about 40 minutes now. I started out easy, right? Lots of cartoons. We went through some jokes. We went through all those pieces. But the last 10 minutes or so, they may have some of you thinking a little bit like this, right? big frowny faces, you're cursing Hank out. This is all sorts of new stuff. I don't have time to learn it all. Well, if you feel like that, like I'm okay with that, that tells me that you're angry. And in the five stages of grief, right, we know that if you've made it to anger, you're out of the denial phase. Because I used to have conversations like this, and, and what I would see wouldn't be angry eyes or angry faces or comments. It would be, Hank, you're crazy. None of this is true. None of this is happening. The network doesn't need to change. Just go away. Thanks for the free lunch. Well, today, anger, right? That's the first step. But where we're trying to get people is to move past bargaining and depression and into acceptance. And more than just acceptance, excitement, excitement about what it means to be a network engineer today, what it means to bring these new skills in. And that's this last section we're going to go into is what does it take to be today's network engineer? And so we see Carl strapped himself to the table here with IT Frankenstein, bringing himself in. And so he put himself together. He put together a three-step approach to network programmability. He started out in phase one with learning some fundamentals of development, maybe some Python, some REST APIs, signed up for Git and GitHub, then moved into phase two where he started to pick up some Linux skills and, and tackled config management with Ansible and, and learned a bit about Docker and then as those skills solidified in phase three, brought in new concepts around networking with Linux networking and container networking, right? This is, this is an approach that we all have to take to be adding into our skill set, adding into our education plan as it goes through. And once you get through it, right, the new network engineer looks a lot like this. Those core networking skills, layer two, layer three fundamentals, security, quality of service, they are just as important as ever. But we also have new networking skills around how networking inside of Linux and containers and cloud will function. Platform skills. Network engineers don't be, have to become big, bushy, beer, Unix, sys admins, but we do need to be comfortable working in a Linux environment because every network platform today is built on top of Linux. And so we have to be comfortable in those areas. If we're going to build networks for Docker and inside of the cloud, we need to know how those platforms work. Like this is just the nature of where we're after. And so I know what you might be thinking, right? That's great. Uh, big props to Carl. He's done a great job. But what about me, Hank? Right? I'm still way back here in the Stone Age. Like, how do I do this problem? How do I solve this myself? And for me, that comes down to resources and material like you, we've talked about today, like Kara mentioned with the network programmability series that's coming out with Medicad. There are tons of resources being put out. And, and that's actually my big passion, and we've spent a lot of time partnered up with Medicad, building content, providing course material to help every network engineer make this transition, accelerate their journey through phase one, phase two, and phase three with webinars like today, on-demand learning labs, courses, videos. There are tons of material that you can absorb and add into your own personal development plan to kind of tackle through this. So I'm going to pause for a second. I haven't been able to keep my eye on the question panel, but I'd like to see we've got, it looks like about five, maybe about five, five to eight minutes here where we can tackle a couple of questions. So do we have any out there? Oh, of course we do, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question is, um, what programming languages are used for best practices for network engineers nowadays? That's a great question. One that, one that I get a ton. 
And I, I firmly and, and unabashedly recommend every network engineer become comfortable with Python as a programming language. Um, there are other programming languages, but without without a doubt, Python has kind of risen to the top, is far and ahead of, of the other choices that are there as an infrastructure programming language, particularly in the networking space. And there's lots of good reasons for that. Python's available on, on any platform from Windows to Mac to Linux. Um, many network devices themselves actually can run Python right on them. And so you can write a Python script with your, with your, your laptop and then actually upload it to a router or switch and execute it there. Um, there's also tons of examples of sample code for doing network administration and operations in Python. And so it is a fantastic language. There's tons of good stuff. And frankly, it's a really easy language to get started with. And we've got labs and examples um, on how to start with Python up on DevNet, as well as some of the course materials inside of Netacat. Awesome. Thank you, Hank. And so the next question, in hindsight to the cloud, what is your perspective of the future direction of wireless? Cloud and wireless. So, so many of the, the um, if I understand the question correctly, there's been a lot of work inside of kind of moving to cloud management and cloud connected wireless access points as they go through. I think that we'll, we'll continue to see some of those pieces. But we're also going to, there are challenges that cloud managed devices start to come through when you, when um, related to, to, to environments that don't have kind of public cloud or public internet accessibility that goes through. Um, I think what we're, we're probably going to see is, is a desire and an effort from networking vendors like Cisco and other vendors to figure out how to offer feature parity in both cloud managed and cloud connected environments as well as on-prem solutions and then go through in that area so that customers can have the choice. Um, with cloud management having some significant advantages related to kind of operations and updates and, and more control that's in there. But we also, uh, many of us know that cloud managed devices are not right for every environment, but we don't want to sacrifice the, the, the good stuff that we get from cloud management types of pieces if we can't have it. And so I think that's what we're going to see is, is a closer and an attempt to bridge the gap between um, how we operate, whether it's cloud connected or not. But that, all that said, I'm, it's been several years since I've been kind of a, a head first and, and really kind of paying attention to what's going on in the wireless space. And so definitely a, an area to keep an eye on and look for other opinions as well. Thanks, Hank. Um, so the next question was, is there any software that can help us to have hands-on experience in net dev ops? Yeah, there's there's tons of, of software components that go through that's in there. Um, I would say that um, there's some learning labs, and if, if there's an email or way to go through, I, I put together a learning track up on DevNet focused specifically kind of on net DevOps and some of the software tools and, and concepts that are important to understand, things like Python and Git, but also open source programs like Vagrant and how you can work with try to put um, CICD pipelines together and leverage the tools. And, and I'll, I'll try to get it over to you, Kara, if you can add it into some of the resources for this episode as a place to get started. In the net DevOps space itself, it, it's a very quickly moving area. Um, and so there's, there's constantly new, new ideas and tools and ide um, pieces coming up in that space. And it's the, the rate of change and the number of tools is both exciting, but also can be very easily overwhelming. So it's, it's, it's an area to go through. Thanks, Hank. And yes, um, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants. So if there's anything at all you'd like to include, I can definitely include it there. Um, and if, if there's anything like you had just mentioned, um, we can also post, you know, like a Word doc or a PDF doc um, on the, the blog website okay. next to the recording. So however you want to do it. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so how... How do open source things like Linux, Docker, um, and such, sorry, I think I'm reading, I'm trying to make sense of this. Okay, so how are open source things like Linux and Docker useful for net DevOps engineers? Uh, so let's, let's tackle the, the two of them there that are pretty easy, Linux and, and Docker. So as, as we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, what the network is, is has evolved and it's not just routers and physical switches. Um, the network now exists also with virtual switches and containerized switches that go through. And so for me, understanding Linux and the fundamentals of Linux are important because 
many of our network appliances are actually running on top of Linux pieces. And so sometimes there's value and need to, to kind of look at the underlying Linux configurations that are there and knowing how the, the networking inside of a, a Linux workstation that's providing networking functions goes through. Because even if it's a network appliance, oftentimes it's, it's hooked into the Linux networking under the hood. And so if you don't understand how to, how to look at the interfaces or how to look at the network configuration of a, a Linux operating system, that can be a gap as you're trying to troubleshoot or operate or work with some of these new pieces. And then similarly with Docker, many, many, I think every enterprise I've talked to recently has, is moving towards a containerized strategy and, and nearly all of them are doing it with Docker for their applications. And so rather than in when virtualization came around, many of us realized that we needed to learn the fundamentals of virtual switching and VMware switching. And similarly, if now that containers are kind of replacing virtual machines, we need to understand the, the Docker, the, the container runtime, which for most organizations is Docker. We have to understand that and then understand how networking works with Docker so that we can effectively design and operate and troubleshoot those. And so I would say that, that Linux and Docker fit into both of those because they are kind of part and parcel to how the network and how the um, infrastructure stack that's providing services are being done. And so if we don't understand them, it's really hard to understand how networking works if we don't have just the fundamentals of Docker or Linux that are in there. And that's why in like the, the roadmap, the three-phase plan, before jumping into Linux and Docker networking skills, right, you have to learn some basics of Linux and basics of Docker. Because once you have that, then you can start to peel back and, and dive deeper into the, the networking elements of those themselves. Thanks, Hank. And I know we are running out of time, so I'll make this the last question. Um, we apologize, everyone, ahead of time if we didn't get to your question. Um, we are limited on time, so I apologize. I know that Wadi is still trying to answer some questions um, in the Q&A, and I'm trying to answer some questions in the chat, so we'll try to get to your question um, privately. But the last question that we're going to do out loud, um, can network automation eliminate the need of network engineers in the future? No, no, I mean, that, that's an easy one that goes through. Whether, whether we're automating it or we're doing it manually, we're still going to need solid network engineers that can, that can look at what are the requirements from an organization, um, design and build an effective network. It's what's changing is the way that network engineers will interact with the network. Um, for, for decades now, it feels like we've interacted with the network in the same way through the CLI. Um, what we're going to see is, is it's becoming more and more difficult to simply work through a CLI interface because the network is becoming larger and more complicated, um, but we still need to interact with it. And that's why learning Python and learning new configuration management tools and, and testing and standard strategies are gonna go through. But it still needs to be network engineers taking those actions. It's just the, the, way, that we, we, the way that we engineer networks is changing the fact that we are network engineers or that the network needs engineering, that isn't changing. It's just kind of the day-to-day -day life and the skill set is, is adjusting that's in there. Hopefully that helps. No, thanks, Hank. And I wanted to call that out because I cannot tell you um, how often that question get, uh, comes up in all kinds of different webinars. So I, I know that it's a question that a lot of the students had on their mind. Um, so thank you, Hank. Um, we really appreciate your wonderful presentation, and I will let you go ahead, and I know you had some closing slides that you wanted to go through. Yeah, so let's let's dive into those. So as we kind of come through this, th this entire presentation is kind of summarized for me in this, this cartoon with Carl and his, his brother, Captain Cloud, here. Um, you're likely feeling like Carl is here, where there's there's so many new things coming at you, where where the network and new, new open source projects and new ideas that go through. And, and it's one of those areas, and, and Captain Cloud may be being a little bit blunt here in the middle tile, but, but frankly, I think that there's, there's some, some importance that we recognize this. We've seen this with other areas in IT and other industries that as change comes through, if, if we don't open ourselves up to it, if we don't figure out how to become excited about the change, and we kind of stick ourselves in the sand and try to stay back in the stone age, we'll find our job going away. So to the last question, are network engineers going away? Absolutely not. But if you don't evolve or your view of what a network engineer is doesn't evolve, you may find yourself not fitting in uh, it, the way that it's gone before. And so that's, that's a piece I like to go through is it's not that network engineers are, are less important than ever. It's just we're becoming, we're changing, we're evolving. And so in today's session, we went through a ton, right? We looked back on the history of networking, network engineering. We talked about the four ages, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Renaissance as we went in. 
Um, this is an exciting time, and it's a time that, that I think that we can all kind of jump at and accept that it's a fun time to be back in networking. Um, I'd, I'd spent a couple of years kind of focusing in on some, some cloud automation and some development pieces, and then I purposely came back to networking because I was super passionate about what we can do in this space, and I think we all can kind of find that passion and dive into it. We'll provide all the resources here, the links and all the stuff to go out, but there are tons of more materials, blog posts, learning resources, videos that you can dive deeper into to tackle these areas. And so the slides here, we'll make sure that they're posted so you can find them. And then as always, I'd like to let everybody know, if you do have questions or you just want to be part of the community, stay in touch. The easiest way to stay in touch with me is up on Twitter if you do the social medias. I'm at HF Preston. I'm very active with new materials related to all these topics. Or you can also find me in WebEx Teams or email the old-fashioned way at HAPresto at Cisco.com. And I encourage everybody to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias for the latest in what's going on in this space. And then with that, just thank you so much for joining me today on the call. I hope everybody's enjoyed it and looking forward to seeing you all on future calls. Thank you so much again, Hank, and thank you everyone again um, for joining us for an hour of your time today, and we really hope to see you on November 13th for the uh, SDN controller session. So again, that, that session will be on November 13th. You can go find more details and register it at the link I'm about to put in the chat window. And I just wanted to say um, a quick note, today's session started an hour later than normal. So again, the, the session on November 13th will start an hour earlier than today. We'll go back to the normal um, webinar time of 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us today and we really hope to see you on November 13th. Thank you, Hank. And a huge thank you to Wadi for answering questions in the Q&A panel today. You rock, thank you. Thanks everybody.